Colorado Magistrate Judge N. Reed Nereider has sanctioned the attorneys behind one of the many baseless 2020 election lawsuits, saying that they took advantage of gullible members of the public. If you've been waiting for some kind of justice or accountability for the many frivolous election lawsuits, I think you'll enjoy this ruling. The lawsuits were brought on behalf of the plaintiffs by attorneys Gary D. Fielder and Ernest John Walker. These attorneys are now the subjects of the massive $186,000 sanctions order. Their election lawsuit was filed in the United States District Court for the District of Colorado on December 22nd of 2020 as a class action lawsuit brought on behalf of 160 million registered voters. It alleged that there was a vast conspiracy between four state governors, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, along with Dominion Voting Systems and Facebook. I use the words vast conspiracy advisedly, says the judge, explaining that is what the complaint, all 84 pages and 409 plus paragraphs, alleges, that the defendants engaged in concerted action to interfere with the 2020 presidential election through a coordinated effort to, among other things, change voting laws without legislative approval, use unreliable voting machines, alter votes through an illegitimate adjudication process, provide illegal methods of voting, count illegal votes, suppress the speech of opposing voices, disproportionately and privately fund only certain municipalities and counties, and other methods all prohibited by the Constitution. These allegations of a vast conspiracy were supported only by plaintiffs' affidavits. For example, Mr. O'Rourke, a Virginia certified public accountant and a self-professed free man born of a free woman and a free man, explains, I have lost any faith in the existing form of government and technology monopolies. I am angry. I am frustrated. I cannot sleep at night. I suffer from anxiety as a result of this uncertainty. I have lost my desire to communicate with most people openly and remain guarded as to my interactions and communications with everyday people. I feel I have no voice, no rights, and I have been 100% abandoned by the government in all its forms. The affidavits of the other plaintiffs are similar in tone and reflect similar beliefs and sentiments summarized in the concluding pages of the complaint. The shared foreboding feeling of impending doom is presently felt by tens of millions of people. All across the country, there is a fear that the people are losing their liberty. For relief, plaintiffs in their complaint seek a mishmash of outcomes, ranging from a permanent injunction to a damage award in the nominal amount of $1,000 per registered voter, which equals damages in the approximate of $160 billion for the alleged constitutional wrongs plaintiffs have suffered. The lawsuit quickly accumulated over 90 docket entries before Judge Nereider ruled on the various motions to dismiss the case. Defendants make numerous arguments as to why plaintiffs' complaint should be dismissed, but one argument appears in all the motions, and even without addressing the myriad others, it ultimately proves fatal to plaintiffs' case. The decisive argument is that the plaintiffs have not demonstrated a judicially cognizable interest or injury sufficient to grant them standing to sue. With plaintiffs not having standing to sue, there is no case or controversy, a necessary predicate or condition for federal court jurisdiction under Article III of the United States Constitution. In granting defendants' motion to dismiss, Judge Nereider explains, as the Supreme Court has often explained, we are instead courts of limited jurisdiction. Article III standing requires plaintiffs to have personally suffered, one, a concrete and particularized injury, two, that is traceable to the conduct they challenge, and that, three, would likely be redressed by a favorable decision from the court. At the pleading stage, any complaint filed in federal court must clearly allege facts demonstrating each element. A particularized injury is one that affects the plaintiff in a personal and individual way. The complaint viewed as a whole is a generalized grievance about the operation of government or about the actions of the defendants on the operation of government, resulting in abstract harm to all registered voting Americans. 
It is not the kind of controversy that is justiciable in a federal court. It should be no surprise to plaintiffs or their counsel that their generalized grievances about their votes being diluted or other votes being improperly counted would be insufficient to grant them the standing required under Article 3 of the Constitution. Numerous other cases challenging the 2020 election and its surrounding circumstances have been dismissed for precisely this reason, among many other reasons. Judge Nereiter then lists some of the myriad failed lawsuits filed in the wake of the 2020 election, Texas v. Pennsylvania, Wood v. Raffensperger, Bognet v. Pennsylvania, Trump v. Bokvar, Trump v. Sagovsky, Bowyer v. Ducey, King v. Whitmer, the Kraken, Fian v. Wisconsin Elections Commission, Texas Voters Alliance v. Dallas County, Iowa Voter Alliance v. Black Hawk County. All of these were insufficiently pled to confer standing, meaning that none of the election lawsuits could show the basic elements of a federal case. So with the O'Rourke v. Dominion case dismissed, Let's fast forward to August 3rd, 2021, when Judge Nereiter ordered the plaintiff's attorneys to pay sanctions in the form of reimbursement to the defendants for defending such a baseless lawsuit. In his order, the court called the complaint one enormous conspiracy theory, saying, while plaintiff's counsel insist that the lawsuit was not intended to challenge the election or reverse the results, the effect of the allegations and the relief sought would be to sow doubt over the legitimacy of the Biden presidency and the mechanics of American democracy, the actual systems of voting, in numerous states. Albeit disorganized and fantastical, the complaint's allegations are extraordinarily serious and, if accepted as true by large numbers of people, are the stuff of which violent insurrections are made. The personal affidavits plaintiffs attached to the original complaint recount the generalized fear and suspicion that the system is rigged and a sense that American democracy no longer works. The affidavits are notable only in demonstrating no first-hand knowledge by any plaintiff of any election fraud, misconduct, or malfeasance. Instead, plaintiff's affidavits are replete with conclusory statements about what must have happened during the election and plaintiff's beliefs that the election was corrupted, presumably based on rumors, innuendo, and unverified and questionable media reports. For example, one affidavit from a resident of Alabama recites, It is obvious our federal election has been tampered with and compromised by Dominion voting systems, along with the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, and his wife, Priscilla Chan, and many others. But, the judge adds, not stated is any non-conclusory basis for the plaintiff to believe this. Another plaintiff was upset that his QAnon posts were fact-checked and deleted by Facebook, and another plaintiff claimed that the elections had been compromised by the defendants, but with no first-person knowledge whatsoever of any election malfeasance or any evidence, direct or indirect, that his own vote was not counted or was inappropriately discounted. These allegations did not rise to the level of a basic legal pleading supporting the occurrence of any election conspiracy whatsoever. Judge Nereiter had dismissed the case for both lack of standing and for the lack of personal jurisdiction of Colorado over other states, noting as an example that Plaintiffs never alleged a single fact suggesting that Pennsylvania defendants took any action having any connection whatsoever to Colorado. All the allegations related to the administration of an election in Pennsylvania for Pennsylvanians and relying on Pennsylvania law. Judge Nereiter went on to impose sanctions on plaintiffs' attorneys for failing to make an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances and that the claims made are so obviously foreclosed by existing precedent as to make them legally indefensible. It must also be noted that this was not a client-driven lawsuit, the judge wrote, as plaintiff's counsel, Mr. Fielder, conceded at the July 16th hearing the lawsuit was his idea. Mr. Fielder and Mr. Walker were not relying on information from the named plaintiffs to construct the suit or for any of the substantive factual allegations. Lawyers who conceive of a lawsuit seeking $160 billion, making allegations questioning the validity of a presidential election, 
and the fairness of the basic mechanisms of American democracy must conduct extensive independent research and investigation into the validity of the claims before filing suit. Beyond being on notice that the fraud and rigging allegations had been seriously questioned or rejected in other courts, Plaintiff's counsel also must have been aware that these same allegations had been, from the very beginning, extensively publicly rebutted by numerous independent and even staunchly Republican sources. Former President Trump's Attorney General, William Barr, is on the record repeatedly saying that, having investigated the claimed allegations of fraud and tampering, there was nothing to them. The judge even notes that the baseless claims made in this lawsuit and others like it contributed to the January 6th attempted coup on the United States Capitol, which resulted in violence and the deaths of five people, including police officers. This lawsuit was filed with a woeful lack of investigation into the law and under the circumstances, the facts. The lawsuit put into or repeated into the public record highly inflammatory and damaging allegations that could have put individuals' safety in danger. Doing so without a valid legal basis or serious independent personal investigation into the facts was the height of recklessness. Mr. Fielder and Mr. Walker could have spent some of the $95,000 they raised from the public to fund this litigation on an expert or three to assess and verify the truth of the information contained in the materials from other lawsuits which were copied into this complaint. Rather than hiring an expert pre-filing, they spoke to no one. It appears that plaintiff's counsel's process for formulating the factual allegations in this lawsuit was to compile all the allegations from all the lawsuits and media reports relating to alleged election fraud and only the ones asserting fraud, not the ones refuting fraud, put it in one massive complaint and then file it and see what happens. With no sense of irony or introspection, plaintiff's counsel repeatedly cite a Time Magazine article as proof of a RICO conspiracy that they allege involved state officials, Facebook, Zuckerberg, and Ms. Chan. But I question whether plaintiff's counsel actually read or bothered to try to understand the Time article, rather than some nefarious plot, the Secret History article describes in detail a valiant effort by both left and right wing groups, labor organizations, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to come together before and after the election to keep the peace and oppose President Trump's assault on democracy. Judge Nereider concludes that this lawsuit was filed in bad faith not warranted by existing law or a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing law or establishing new law, that plaintiff's counsel did not conduct a reasonable inquiry into whether the factual contentions had evidentiary support, that this lawsuit should never have been filed in the first place, and that no reasonable attorney admitted to practice before the district court would file such a document. Judge Nereider then ordered defendants to submit documentation as to the amount of time and money they spent defending the plaintiff's baseless, frivolous lawsuit. On November 22, 2021, the judge ordered attorneys Gary D. Fielder and Ernest John Walker to pay over $186,000 to the various defendants. The defendants had submitted various billing records, most if not all of which were less than their standard hourly rates representing a discount which would lubricate the judge's imposition of the sanctions, making it difficult for the plaintiff's attorneys to successfully object. Of course, the attorneys filed objections to the amount of the sanctions, but their objection was only three pages long and, similar to their original lawsuit, contained little useful argument and no evidence. Of note in the sanctions order, Judge Nereider repeats that this was a frivolous and groundless case brought by plaintiff's attorneys for their personal gain and not part of zealous and enthusiastic advocacy for sincere and injured plaintiffs. Quote, I do recognize that the two plaintiff's counsel are individuals and not corporate entities, and that regardless of how successful their law practices may be, a more than $90,000 sanction award per lawyer will likely impose a degree of financial hardship. To this extent, I have tried to take into account their respective abilities to pay, 
But it bears repeating that, as officers of the court, these attorneys have a higher duty and calling that requires meaningful investigation before prematurely repeating in-court pleadings unverified and uninvestigated defamatory rumors that strike at the heart of our democratic system and were used by others to foment a violent insurrection that threatened our system of government. In assessing the amount of the sanction, I also take into account the fact that Plaintiff's Counsel made a public appeal for financial contributions from arguably innocent and gullible members of the public in order to supposedly hire experts to support this case. Plaintiff's counsel had raised approximately $95,000 from approximately 2,100 contributors. In reality, plaintiff's counsel hired no experts and did not speak to any of the alleged experts that were being used in other cases around the country. This financial appeal to the public for financial contributions was arguably deceptive. I also take into account the risk that this substantial sanction might chill zealous advocacy for potentially legitimate claims, but I conclude that the repetition of defamatory and potentially dangerous, unverified allegations is the kind of advocacy that needs to be chilled. Counsel should think long and hard and do significant pre-filing research and verification before ever filing a lawsuit like this again. As explained previously, this was a damages case with no need for urgency or immediate injunctive relief, and therefore there was no legitimate basis for filing suit without being certain about the claims. I do not believe that sanctioning these lawyers for this lawsuit threatens to chill appropriate legitimate legal advocacy in the future. I have also considered the degree of counsel's culpability, which is significant. This was not a client-generated lawsuit. This is exclusively a creation of the plaintiff's counsel. They are experienced lawyers who should have known better. They need to take responsibility for their misconduct. Defendants have been significantly prejudiced, not just because they have had to incur legal fees to defend this pointless and unjustified lawsuit, but because they have been defamed without justification in public court filings. Finally, I believe that rather than a legitimate use of the legal system to seek redress for redressable grievances, this lawsuit has been used to manipulate gullible members of the public and foment public unrest. To that extent, this lawsuit has been an abuse of the legal system and an interference with the machinery of government. For all these reasons, I feel that a significant sanction award is merited. Judge Nereider then ordered plaintiff's counsel, Gary D. Fielder and Ernest John Walker, to jointly and severally pay $186,922 to the various defendants, concluding yet another baseless, frivolous, 2020 election lawsuit. I hope you enjoyed hearing about some small amount of justice for the perpetrators of these cases. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to our top supporters in November. John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, Pure Magma, Drew Hart, Tech Tech Potato, Eric Tams, and the Blood Soaked Survivors. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube membership, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly production live stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.